Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And as those of you who've been following the news know, we recently looked at the 10-year anniversary of the Katrina storm uh, disaster in New Orleans. So our guest tonight is someone who has written a fictional account of that. Ed Bannis, author of Storm Surge. Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's John, but uh, very John, honored to be here. My last guest was Ed, you know, so <laughs> so for me, you're going to be Ed. We'll just call you Ed. For I'll just call I answer to hey you. It's, yeah, it'll work. <laughs> you can call me whatever you like. Um, Sir. <laughs> so, John, um, and just to show you how, and our audience will be um, shocked, but just to show you how unprepared I am for this entire show. Um, I, uh, I normally like to read the books of the authors I'm, I'm interviewing, and in this case, I will um, follow one of my idols um, of TV, that is John Stewart, who, who openly admitted that he never prepares for, for interviews. <laughs> and so, um, in the spirit of honoring John Stewart, um, I have uh, not read the book, so I'm going to conduct an entire interview about a book that I haven't read. <laughs> so this will be an experiment in television. Great. You, you, you with me on that? I'm with you. Okay, great. So, John Ed, um, <laughs> uh, what, what prompted you to write a book about uh, New Orleans? Because before the show we were talking about this, and you yourself have never lived in New Orleans. Right. Um, so what made you think of that as, as a setting for the, for, the, for the book? Being a new author and trying to get noticed by uh, what a friend of mine calls the PIC, the Publishing Industrial Complex, the traditional mm -hmm. publishing mm -hmm. houses, um, you, need, you need to get noticed somehow. You need some kind of a marketing gimmick or something. And... Uh, uh, because they're, they really can't afford to take a risk on a new voice. I mean, James Patterson, of course, because he, he's proven that he can sell books. Me, not so much yet. So uh, I needed something to, uh, that people could relate to. And this being, you know, we were approaching the, the anniversary. Uh, I knew that would be big news. There would probably be specials. Why not write a book involving uh, Katrina as a backdrop and use it as a, as a thriller and a personal growth uh, experience for my characters? So, what happens? Without, so, without giving away the book so that people won't read it, all right. what, what's a, a synopsis of the story? Synopsis is uh, a, a Chicago couple, kind of on the marital bubble, um, are impacted by Katrina. Uh, the, uh, uh, the gentleman is on a uh, kind of the bubble at work because of a merger, mm -hmm. and uh, so he's in danger of losing his job. So the wife takes a, uh, uh, a risky assignment from her company uh, to button up a a data center, a data center down in uh, New Orleans, and I know that's not how you pronounce it, but <laughs> I'm a Midwesterner. <laughs> for, for us, it can be New Orleans. New Orleans. If you live there, it's New Orleans. New Orleans or something like that, yeah. And, um, and so she takes this risky assignment and gets caught down there because she was checking on a beloved relative. And so she gets caught in the she, storm. She gets caught in the storm, yeah. and uh, uh, she has to write it out. The, uh, the husband, still in the safety of Chicago, uh, is kind of goaded into going down there and trying to find her and bring her back home oh, safely. She's incommunicado because all of the communication lines have been cut. They absolutely went down. In fact, that's kind of how the book starts. Oh. And, and uh, so he has to go down there against all odds and find her, thinking that she'd be in one place. But, you know, circumstances are somewhat different. And he's goaded uh, into going down there by his children and his uh, mother-in-law and a, uh, a neighbor that and is there, is there some suspicion that if it were up to him, he might not do this? Right. He's kind okay. of a mousy guy. Okay. So this is kind of a, a, a big step for him. And he's paired, uh, and he's, he's an indoor kind of guy, uh, works in IT as well. And uh, a neighbor of his has a boat, uh, kind of thinks that his, his neighbor, the protagonist, uh, needs to go down there and find his wife and, and be a man and do that. And when it's really not a good idea because, <laughs> I mean, the city is, is a million people. I mean, and, and they're all scattered to the wind, and it's no pun yeah, intended. Yeah, yeah, but, but um, so and it's flooded. It's, it's, it's a disaster flooded. area. It's a disaster area. So the boat comes in handy, mm -hmm. and uh, this this neighbor knows a lot more about this uh, this family than than the mm -hmm. protagonist would care to know. So uh, it's really it's um, kind of a twist on the classic: the lady disappears kind of. Plot, Absolutely. Uh, plot I'm on, right? So right. the wife is somewhere. We don't know where. Well, actually, we do know where. I do kind of uh, uh, give her scenes because uh, uh, she is introduced to uh, some folks that, that help her mm -hmm. and, uh, and some that can't help her but are along for the ride. And believe it or not, one of those is a um, kind of a ne'er-do-well uh, FEMA uh, uh, director, <laughs> sorry, assistant director. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in charge of putting the plan together. The, the actual rec uh, the actual recovery plan for the city, right? And and the, and, and the plan for enduring and, and what they're mm -hmm. going where they're going to put the shelters, mm -hmm. how many you know where, how the logistics, bringing in food, water, 
um, all those things, and he was in charge of that, and of course, being a government agency, that plan, which was good to start with, gets cut up. Uh -huh. and, well, at one time, though, if, as I recall the history of this, that um, FEMA actually had done a very good job on, on various disasters under uh, the Clinton administration, right, but, right. but um, the ensuing administrations didn't believe in funding these particular government agencies. Right. Uh, and so they were underfunded, understaffed, ill-staffed, and um, what was his name? Brownie. Brown, yes. Yeah, um, who was the head of FEMA at the time. And, and they were blasted in the press because oh. they had been allowed yeah. to just simply deteriorate to the point where they couldn't handle it. The, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the shameful thing is uh, President Bush kept saying positive, making positive remarks, and when everything, the, the ship was sinking. Yeah, the reality he, on the he, ground he, is very different. And it was very, very evident that, uh, that Michael Brown did not have the experience or the leadership skills to, to bring FEMA through this and help people. Yeah, it was, it was mm -hmm. a very terrible, uh, it, and the people, the, the hard, the bad thing about it is the folks that they were trying to help suffered horribly. I mean, there were a lot of stories about what happened in the super, uh, the, uh, the Superdome, uh, Superdome right. and um, a lot of those really didn't pan out to be true. There were deaths. There were some. There no. were some gangland activity, but uh, a lot of it uh, really didn't happen. But of course, being a, a, a thriller, authors <laughs> like to take a little bit of poetic license. Sure, sure. <laughs> so some of those things do happen in your some book. Some of those right? things do happen. Yeah. In fact, that the Superdome is where the book ends. Interesting. Um, so I won't ask you to reveal the ending. We'll let okay. people read the book to find out how that happens. Great. Um, what, um, this is your first novel. Now, you've written short stories in the past, right? Yes, I have. Um, what, um, what prompted you to want to go all full-length novel? Well, um, you know, I'll tell you, I, I, I think a, sh a novel is really just a short story with more characters in it, <laughs> frankly. And uh, I kept reading uh, novels such as uh, from uh, uh, Dan Brown, uh, mm -hmm. The uh, Da Vinci Code, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I can write like this person. I think I can, uh, I can, I can match this. So I wanted to test myself, mm. and and there it is. In fact, to tell you the truth, I, I would probably like, I would stand for a, a career change right now. Uh, that would be, a, I'd love to be a full-time author. So we want to encourage as many people as possible to go buy your book Ab right off, you. of, off of Amazon. Right? <laughs> Absolutely, to allow you to follow that career path. That's now, true. speaking of career paths, so. Um, Many people who, who choose writing as a career path do so when they're in their teens. Right. And so they're, by the time they're in their 20s, they, they already have a body of work. True. Um, you've come to it very late. What, uh, what were you thinking of when you were much younger, and why do you think this has appealed to you now at this particular stage? Money, uh, quite <laughs> frankly, seriously. Um, when I was younger, uh, I, I think it's uh, when somebody's just entering college or, you know, uh, they're 18 years old. And back in the 70s, when I was 18 years old, <laughs> don't worry, it, it so was, was I. <laughs> it was, it was. I find it so difficult to to expect a person of that age to really know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. Now, if you do, fine. My my daughter uh, is uh, 20 years old now. She's going to be 21 actually in, in the spring. She's in New York University. She knows what she wants to do. Go for it. I think she's a rarity. I really didn't know what I wanted to do, so uh, I was actually cajoled into uh, writing for the school newspaper and people enjoyed my columns. Mm. Uh, I did opinion columns, I, I uh, learned how to uh, uh, develop a black and white uh, film at the time in an art class and so you know I, I, I did uh, some opinion uh, columns uh, that you'd see in, in the old Sun Times uh, 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 newspaper but uh, I, I enjoyed writing, I just didn't really think of it as a career because I thought gosh that's um, that's so tenuous. That's so. Uh, y y it's a very hit or miss. Yes, it is. And, and you can be a great writer and never sell. Exactly. And there are a right. lot of voices out there that mm -hmm. really deserve to be heard. And that's the beauty about e-publishing. Uh, I think that's that's uh, that's going to be a great boon to this industry. And so your book is self-published as well, it, right? Through Amazon. Through Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And it's uh, uh, it's nothing really if uh, to any aspiring author that, that may be watching the show. You know, it's it's a great way to get noticed. There's a, there was a Wall Street Journal article about a gentleman, and I don't remember his name, but he was rejected by 33 publishing houses, and uh, despondent, he just said, "What the heck? I'll just hang it up on Amazon.com." And he sold 407,000 copies within the space of nine months. The traditional publishing houses came calling. It's kind of my strategy. Sure, they they shoot they they saw that this could sell. Yeah. Now, how how did that particular author? Um, manage to get the word out. I mean, how, that, that's the biggest problem is, you know, you can put it up, 
but there's so many books on Amazon. There's so many websites. Right. It's like, how do you draw people to your book? Social media. And it's kind of, uh, the social media now is, is old fashioned uh, word of mouth, really. Okay. It's just yeah, with it's higher just tech. On, it's electronic now, but exactly. it's still word of mouth. Exactly, and, and uh, uh, I have a Facebook page, and of course I mention my book mm -hmm. quite frequently. <laughs> <laughs> on that, uh, whereas my friends probably are upset with me. Invite all your friends to come read it, it review exactly. it. Exactly, and, and uh, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really a, a grassroots kind of experience. Uh, I have friends that uh, are uh, kind of in the industry. The, uh, one of my friends has a, a podcast, a regular podcast. Mm -hmm. She's going to uh, mention it there, and she uh, belongs to a book club. Uh, I don't know if it's Goodreads, or, or uh, there's a, a few really good other uh, book clubs online. And um, she uh, she's going to recommend that. Here's what she's reading, and uh, and 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 it's it it it's amazing what that does because a lot of people pay more attention to that instead of commercials or ads. I think because the commercials and ads tend to come off as being well, I'm trying to sell something. Right, right. But if it's from word of mouth uh, or this new high tech social media, then. You know, it's 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 a more honest feel to to the recommendation for the book. And and uh, actually, my uh, a number of years ago, my wife published her own book on Amazon as well. Okay. And so I know it is actually pretty straightforward. Yeah. It's not difficult to do. So I, I I like your advice to authors if they're looking for a place. Well, it you can do it now. Exactly. Um, and there's as you know, there's no um, production costs at all. Right? It's free. It, yeah, and you don't have to print up co hard copies. It's an electronic, it's an ebook. And and if you don't have a Kindle. No matter what, if you have an iPhone or iPad or just a mm -hmm. PC, um, they can, uh, in fact, right right below the picture of my book on Amazon.com, and mm -hmm. of course, here's a, a picture here's of the cover. There's right? the cover. <laughs> By John, John Bannis. John Not Ed. Ed. He's, no. your, he's your brother, right? Ed, <laughs> yes, my evil twin. Yes, there you go. <laughs> and um, you can, uh, right underneath the picture of the cover, you can download for free an app that will allow you to read the, uh, anything that they mm -hmm. publish on any device. It's uh, it's really kind of a neat thing. This is this is going to be such a boon to this industry, and there's going to be an awful lot of bad voices. Oh sure, uh, too. Sure. But but I think um, voices now will really start give it get a chance that voices that need to be heard. The world's waiting to hear from them, and now they're going to get a chance. Well, and and there is um you know I, we did talk about how often great talent goes unnoticed, but right. but nonetheless, um, there are ways for talent to be heard now that didn't exist before, yep. right? And so that's a great boon to aspiring writers. Um, so, what is it about writing? Now, writing generally is seen as a very solitary profession. You have to sit down in front of your, in the old days, your, your, your big yellow tablet, right. and then you know your computer. And um, so, what is it about this that that um, appeals to you most? How do you see yourself transitioning into this life of the, uh, the solitary author? You know, it, and I'm a people person too, so it's going to be hard. It, it, it's it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. That's why I actually get more work done on the train. I commute downtown, and most of this. Book and you, have, you have a full time job. I have a full time else, job. Right? Oh yes. That's what do you do for? I, I'm I'm actually a consultant. I work for uh, uh, the client is Chase, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm a project manager, an IT project manager, information technology. I suspected as much because your characters are in IT, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You have to write what you know. Is that yeah, what Hemingway yes, said? You do have to do that, right? <laughs> and so the. Um, w it, 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 I got a lot of work done just by sitting by myself, but with other people on the train, mm -hmm. uh, and it's awfully difficult. I'm not a very disciplined person, so you know I'll, I'll try to write at home. And You're not a disciplined project manager. Well, no, I'm not a disciplined yeah. person. Yeah, person, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, no. Pr the beautiful thing about project management is there's rules that yeah, you the, follow. Yeah, you, fo and you so it's follow, the follow the program. And generally, exactly. it works. Exactly right. the flowchart. But at home, I can, you know, under the guise of doing research, I can go and. Mm -hmm. Look at things on the internet uh, for a long period of time and not really get back to what I really should be doing and producing uh, sentences. And it's just. Uh, well, that's a, that's a good segue for a moment because before the show, we talked about some of the research you were able to right. do and how um, mapping technology, you know, Google Maps being the most common. Oh, yeah. But how maps have helped you figure out how to write this book. You can travel to some place without even going there. And normally, uh, what's good about. Uh, uh, a good author will will go someplace and, and experience mm -hmm. something. I've heard of uh, uh, authors learning how to pick locks so they can explain how to do it, how mm -hmm. the, what the what it feels like, what the sounds are. You miss some of that, but I can look and see what where things are, where, where landmarks uh, are in relation to where I want to put my characters. Mm -hmm. I looked for a place uh, 
to put my characters where it flooded the most. And uh, I did, I started off actually low tech, if I could uh, mention, sure. this dummies book. <laughs> New Orleans <laughs> for, New for Orleans, dummies. Right. <laughs> and in the first couple yeah. of uh, uh, chapters, they talk about Katrina. Mm -hmm. And they have maps and, and, and uh, uh, there's discussion about uh, what happened, the timeline, which was very important. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it started flooding actually at 4.30 in the morning. That, that, that's long before the... Uh, and it flooded, as I recall, it flooded very quickly. Very quickly. Like yes. within 30 minutes, there were many feet of water in the streets. And, and the problem is the landscape down there, too. To the mm -hmm. east of the city, there's a lot of swampland, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where on the southeast side is the Lower Ninth Ward, mm -hmm. uh, where one of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, industrial canal, uh, the levee it gave cracked. Away. It just yeah. gave away. And, and I, there's some horrible pictures of ho shotgun houses, uh, long, long, low houses that were just knocked off of their their foundations like mm -hmm. trailer uh, in, in, in right. a, for after a tornado or something. It was terrible. And it was the water pressure that did that, it right? It was the water the pressure because water, right? they really didn't get a lot of, uh, lot of damaging wind. Mm -hmm. The winds basically came from, in, in, a, in this hemisphere, again from my research, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a storm, a tornado or a hurricane is a, is a low. Mm -hmm. And lows rotate for, uh, counterclockwise. So the hurricane actually came uh, uh, east, uh, it landed to fall east of uh, the city. And so they were getting easterly winds and northeasterly winds, which brought uh, the, the, the water up through and funneled into the, the mouth of Lake Pontchartrain down there, mm -hmm. built up there, and it just collapsed into the swampland and it just inundated the, the lower Ninth Ward uh, and the, the industrial canal and put a lot of pressure, water pressure, on uh, the, uh, the levees there, and they just gave way. Uh, so uh, the, coming back to, to the idea of research, so you were able to also reconstruct the events of the storm right. and, and having the great advantage of hindsight 10 years later that you could see how this thing really played out whereas in real time we were all guessing what was really happening. It's really a gift of technology. There is a, uh, uh, again from the Wall Street Journal, there it was a graphic that was actually interactive that showed you how everything flooded. Mm. And it, it, the research available to authors is just amazing. Take advantage of the internet. It's, you have to kind of fact check the, the internet sure. at times. Wikipedia. But you're writing fiction on the other hand. Well, that's so. true. So anything can happen. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and you, yes, yeah. poetic license is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so um, what do you plan to do next? I mean, now that you've, you've written a short story, a couple mm. of short stories, you've had, um, now you've made the jump. You're a novelist now. Um, so where do you hope to, to go? What's next? I'm already working on my next book, um, a political thriller. Uh, I am an alderman for an the city of West official. Chicago. Yeah. Right? And uh, so my next work is going to be uh, a working title is called An Uncivil War. <laughs> <laughs> I myself have, have spent time in the political arena, so I'm, I'm familiar with those uncivil wars. You're right. So yes, I've, I've, I've experienced them myself. There's the, 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 uh, the north and the south, the blue and the gray. Well, mine's going to be the left and the right. Mm, but the, the, yeah. the working title is An Uncivil War, and it's, uh, and it's about uh, a, uh, an iconic Chicago family. The beautiful thing about Chicago and living in Chicago's shadow, if you will, mm. Uh, is the uh, the corruption and the politics and the arguments and that just lends itself to a lot of creative thinking. Uh, it's a, a, a wealth of raw material for for a novelist, right? It, it absolutely, it's it, it's like um, that 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 flame to a fly. And 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 <laughs> my the 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 theme of that book is what if one or both parties, political parties, uh, overstepped the bounds and made the leap from. Uh, a, a political party to say organized crime kind of activities. Well, well there are those who would claim that both parties have already done that, right? Yeah, oh, especially in this state. Yes, mm -hmm. but uh, everybody calls the state the, the thuggery or Chicago politics, <laughs> uh, thuggery politics, and and even though I, I I've lived here since 1969, uh, it's 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 kind of entertaining to watch. Uh, I, Sad, but entertaining. I, I, it might have been the old columnist Mike Royko. I'm trying to remember who said this, but. The, they talked about uh, in, in, in most cities, you know, following sports, follow the teams. So that's, that's the major activity. I said, in Chicago, yeah, we pay attention to sports teams, but politics is where it's at. <laughs> that's what everybody wants to follow, right? That's the indoor sport of that, Chicago. That was the winning game. I mean, yeah, let's face yeah. it, for a long time in my youth, uh, we didn't really have very many winning sports teams. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> yes, we had a long and, history. And, of course, our politicians were very helpful in, uh, in producing and, the entertainment for us. Yes, indeed. Um, so it will be set in the city of Chicago. Set um, in the city of Chicago. And city council, it's kind of council. Well, no, not really. It's kind of a, a family that's sort of split by ideology. Okay. Um, if you will, on, on, on uh, one side we have an iconic family, a mayor, 
grandfather, father, and and the current uh, son is the mayor of Chicago. That would never happen in a never city. Never like happen in this city. You no. never, you know, a father can't help his son. What was it that? <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Except I can't do it with a Chicago accent. Yeah. But um, and, and and on the other side, uh, the uh, married into that family is a uh, big box store owner. Mm. And uh, it's how this family kind of deals with their. Uh, two sons running for the governorship of the state. Interesting conflict. Uh, very interesting conflict, yes. and 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 and, uh, and how they go about behind the scenes trying to sabotage each other's. So the two sons are running against each other. Two son sons are running. Yeah, well, uh, cousins are running okay. against each yeah. other, yeah. and uh, another uh, son from the uh, uh, the big box side is it doesn't want any part of that. He wants to be absolutely middle of the road, kind of where I want to be, mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, is a uh, a reporter. Mm. and uh, needs that big story, well, he's going to get one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> More than he wants. <laughs> yeah. um, so you mentioned before the show also that, that you have the ability, um, when you get on a roll, to just write continuously. And, and yeah. you told, said it was, what, only six months to write the... Right. In fact, I started uh, uh, January 5th, uh, and writing on the train and at work at, uh, at lunchtime, uh, some at home. It, it, by the June 25th, I was uploading to um, Amazon.com. You know, I, I read an interview years ago about uh, an interview with Stephen King, who talked about his own writing, and and he said that um, he he would he would have similar spurts where he would just have to write, and he said it was just it was like it was um, so pent up inside he had to get it out. Right. It was just it just flowed out, um, and so he would write his books fairly quickly because he just there's just so much in there it just flowed out. So is that the kind of zone thing that that you yeah. experience as well it's it's you know when you have a thought you just don't want to stop uh, you know here, here's dinner no no thanks I got just a few more minutes and you know an hour or two later I'm, I'm wrapping up it, yeah. it's when you have that idea you don't want to forget anything in fact uh, sometimes my synopsis my outlines mm -hmm. get a little bit too detailed because I'll think of something I want to make sure I remember it when mm -hmm. I come back and do the first draft and uh, so I'll, I'll write all these notes and it's just the idea is just you think of one thing and it spurs a thought on another and so writing is a process, you know, it's, yeah, I've got an idea, but it grows while right. I'm, I'm, I'm producing it. So as a self-published author, though, um, one of the advantages of working with a publishing house is the uh, assistance of an editor, who, people who are trained in how to, you know, make it tighter, right. make it better. Right. Um, so in the self-publishing world, you don't have that, that assistance. So how do you work with that? Uh, that drawback. Very patient wife and <laughs> friends. And you know what, to tell you the yeah. truth, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because I can't really edit myself. No, I, no one can, I'm, it, trust me. It's really tough because I'll read something and, I, and my mind will say, yeah, 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 I get it. I, I, mm -hmm. I, we could pass this, this part. No, you can't do that. I had to, I was reading a part of my, my manuscript to a friend and it just sounded awful. And this was like my third draft. I, yeah. thought, I can't believe I missed that. So the next draft, the fourth and final draft, I actually read out loud, or kind of whispering to myself on the train in the quiet car, <laughs> so you know, and, 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 and you know, mouthing the words, yeah. and that really helped. Uh, Unfortunately, in the era of cell phones, talking to yourself is no longer seen as being weird. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> Especially yeah, with the earpiece. Yeah, and, yeah, you just put a Bluetooth yeah, in here, yeah. and you can read out loud all you want, right? <laughs> exactly, but you know, it's it's kind of the, the, the sometimes the language you want to keep down, uh, <laughs> trying to make it a real book, yeah. and, you know, realistic. So, but I think that's a very interesting concept that in order to see if it flows really to read it out loud and see how it sounds when it's spoken because you'll you'll your ears will pick up yeah. things that your eyes won't necessarily see oh, absolutely in fact especially with the dialogue hmm. especially with the dialogue um, and um, in, in this book uh, uh, storm surge you know it's in new orleans and so i have a few characters that are actually written like mark twain wrote um, in, uh, in in dialogue and it's hard to do mm -hmm. uh, I had no idea how to do that. In fact, there's a site that's, uh, that really would translate uh, words from Cajun mm -hmm. <laughs> into, uh, for like Mamir was, would be a mother or grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so I would uh, use those, uh, those words in, sprinkled into uh, the dialogue, just kind of for effect and reality. And, and so never having lived there, how did you pick up the actual dialect of, of, the, of the Cajun? How, how did you learn that? Uh, you know, I've heard it before. I mean, you know, yeah. there, there's other TV shows and, and, mm -hmm. and, and you, you kind of get a cadence of this thing, and it's kind of a re more relaxed, uh, almost sort of French kind of thing, but mm -hmm. a very um, working class kind of, uh, uh, of feel to that language. And mm -hmm. it's uh, one of the, my favorite movies, The Big Easy, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of funny because all the real 
uh, folks in New Orleans kind of roll their eyes at the fake accents. <laughs> but, but you know, uh, yeah. Dennis Quaid uh, started in that. It was, a, it was an interesting thriller. Uh, and, uh, you know, you kind of get the cadence and, and the, uh, the, the, the syllable usage where, the, where they draw out syllables from that. So that you keep, I retain that in your mind, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what I, I, I put in the book. And besides, again, it's a work of fiction. Yeah. <laughs> and as long as you don't use too much of it, it's not right. going to be that big a deal. Exactly, right? exactly. The, the, that, that's the trick, mm -hmm. not to go overboard and overextend yourself. You still mm -hmm. have to keep credibility because you don't know who's going to be reading this book. Well, I know it's interesting. I know, um, I know a lot of musicians, and, and they always talk about, playing within yourself, right. like knowing where your limits are. And every now and then you can push them, but many times, especially in performance, you know, play within yourself, know yeah. where you're good, know where your sweet spot is. Right. And so I'm sure that in writing, you probably have that same kind of- Absolutely. Right within yourself. Absolutely, yeah, write what you know, as mm -hmm. again, what Hemingway said. And you know what, uh, because you have, it, it builds credibility. You can almost, it's almost like you're giving advice to your readers uh, as to, what happens and what it's like to either you know be let go uh, at work. Um, of course, nowadays I'm sure a lot more yeah, people know. Many people probably don't right. know what that feels like, right? But it, it, and, and it's, you're, 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 you're helping them live through it. Hemingway, uh, I liked his short stories a lot better than his, mm -hmm. his novels because he had a way of turning a phrase that could absolutely make you draw you in and make the reader uh, make the story their own. For instance, in the short uh, story called uh, "The Short Happy Life of Francis McComber." Mm -hmm. It was about a, a, a hunter and his wife, and his wife was having an affair with the guide, and another. Oh, I read that. And, yeah. And he's out on a game hunt, and he's shooting at what, a, big a rhino, a, a rhino, charging rhino, charging rhino. Right. Yeah, I, I won't spoil it for those who haven't. Oh, okay. Read it, but but uh, well, yeah, that's a, a somebody gets story. shot in the in, in a face, <laughs> and and <laughs> right. know, most most authors nowadays would go into the grisly details, details yeah. to describe that. Yeah. No, all Hemingway. This is sheer genius. He would have one of his other characters say. Um, I wouldn't turn him over. <laughs> and, and now all of a sudden, you know. yeah, you know, then all of a sudden it's your thoughts of what that would be and it's your story. Mm -hmm. Sheer genius. Well, uh, of course, it's almost redundant to say, yes, Hemingway was a genius. I mean, yeah. Widely recognized as such. But I think you're right that there are, are certain um, turns of phrase and, and also within context. I, I remember reading a book, a science fiction book, where there was a certain phrase about uh, a guy had just, he just killed someone. And, and mm -hmm. the way it was phrased that the, the, the um, soullessness of the killing was and said and they just finished up with the sentence and then the character's name Cordo and then Cordo walked out into a cool Washington November <laughs> as though no big deal no big deal right no, yeah, and you really got the sense you feel it you felt it yeah, yeah it sent chills it's like ooh this and, was and evil that's, that's the that's the job of the author is to make this make you the reader mm -hmm. feel this and make it your own story and mm -hmm. to help you do that so we're just here to, to, to describe at a minimum. We want, in fact, I don't really do a lot of description of my characters or how fit they look physically. I want you to do that. Which I, I in fact, I, I really admire that in, in, in writing because um, over description of a scene or a character, I think can just ruin it. Now, and I, I usually hate having the last word in an interview, but since we've <laughs> conducted this whole interview as an experiment, um, I have to have the last word because we're out of time. Absolutely. Really? So, John, not Ed, your evil twin, um, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. for It's an honor to be here. Really appreciate it, and I, I hope everyone goes out to Amazon and buys your book. And, in fact, I will even read your book at this point. How about that? Great. Well, so, thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us once again on Public Perspective. Our, our, our guest tonight has been John Bannis, author of Storm Surge. You can find it on Amazon.com. And you can find us on uh, publicperspective.tv on the web. And you can see us every Saturday night at 9 on Comcast Channel 19. So thank you. And until next time, good night.